Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminars from the Archives of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Change and Renewal, a conversation with Jean Shinoda Bolin and Jacqueline Matfield. This episode is part of an evening with Jean Shinoda Bolin when the Institute was going through a major change. The Institute was about to sell its building in Evanston and split into two entities, the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago, which would continue the training of Jungian psychoanalysts, and the C.G. Jung Center in Evanston, which would continue the clinic and related programs. This is the context for a lecture by Jean Shinoda Bolin and this conversation with Jacqueline Matfield. It was recorded on April 3, 2003. The lecture, Meeting Hecate at the Crossroad, Making Soul-Shaping Decisions, which came after this conversation, is available in our store. This free podcast is made possible by your support. Help us continue to provide educational content worldwide by joining our holiday giving drive. This year has been hard on many institutions, and though we have been able to move much of our work online, not everything is able to be done without being in a room together. Your support will help us make it through this difficult period. Jean Shinoda Bolin, MD, is a psychiatrist, Jungian analyst, and internationally known author and speaker. She is the author of The Tao of Psychology, Goddesses in Every Woman, Gods in Every Man, and many other books. She is a Distinguished Life Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and a former clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California in San Francisco, a past board member of the Miss Foundation for Women and the International Transpersonal Association. Jacqueline A. Matfeld, Ph.D., has advanced degrees in humanistic gerontology, art history, and music history. She has been a member of the faculties of Harvard University, MIT, Sarah Lawrence College, Brown University, and Columbia University. She is Professor Emerita of Arizona State University and past president of Barnard College in New York City. For nearly 20 years, she has taught, lectured, and written about the theories and experiences of late life development. She was the co-developer of the MA in Gerontology program at Northeastern Illinois University and established the program in creative aging at the Young Institute of Chicago. From 2000 through 2006, she was the executive director and director of public programs at the C.G. Young Center in Evanston, where she served on the board of trustees through 2014. She now serves as board member emeritus. There are links to the lecture portion uh, of this evening in the show notes, as well as a link to join our holiday giving drive. Every donation really does make a difference. Um, you can also donate by going to youngchicago.org slash give. Thanks. We are very pleased to have the opportunity to welcome Jean Shinoda Bolin and we will talk about each of our conversationalists in turn. Over the years, Jean has been a guiding beacon for many on this journey that we call life. Like many others, my initial, my initial introduction to Jean came through her 1984 publication of the books Goddesses in Every Woman. In that groundbreaking look at women's psychology, Jean offered women a path to a deeper understanding of the underlying forces that govern our lives. In 1989, she offered the same vision to men with her publications of Gods in Every Man. Over the intervening years, she has continued providing maps for the exploration of the inner journeys of life and the deeper layers. Her Tao of Psychology, the book on synchronicity, is often one of the first books that I recommend to clients who are beginning to embark on an exploration of of the deeper levels of life's journey. So along with Jean, we have Jackie, our executive director here at the Institute. Those of us who work with Jackie on a daily basis cannot believe our good fortune in having found this woman of myriad talents to lead the Institute during this time of transition. Her guidance has offered the wisdom 
of innate talent and years of experience in the stewardship of a complicated and diverse community. She guides us with the gentle wisdom of a crone. So tonight, Jean and Jackie will engage in a casual conversation, and we all get to eavesdrop. <laughs> they will be speaking of change and renewal, a topic so timely at the Institute and also in the world. So please join me in welcoming Jean and Jackie. Well, this is a big adventure for me. Uh, I was thinking about it as we rode on the cab back from the airport, which is nothing if not an experience in itself these days to pick up anybody at the O'Hare Airport. And it was the first time we've ever met. So we began to talk to explore who each of us was outside what we knew on our resumes and I knew from her books. So maybe we've had the conversation already. And what would we do then? However, it's a big topic, and I think that there's no one in the room who is not aware that at this time when the whole world is in agony over war, when there are so many women and men and children who are being destroyed, whose lives are being obliterated, and who will have to rise from the ashes on both sides at the end of this terrible thing terrible war. So in one sense, we're talking about change and renewal against a very big backdrop. At another level, we can talk about the change of organizations and institutions. And we were chuckling in the car about the fact that the more things change, the more they remain the same. That could be good, and that could be not so good. And this institute, which was and has been for so many years now, about soul, about self, about individual growth and maturity and becoming all one is meant to be, is now faced with a very practical set of problems. And we are not going to look the same way we do now. And so we are having individually and collectively to think about change, change in an organization that is, in a sense, a corporal change. We are all part of a single body, the body of this institute. So we all share apprehension about what's going to happen to us and some excitement, because who knows what lies around the corner. And finally, each of us faces change. Some of us because we're hitting midlife. Some of us because we are well aware that we are in old age. Some of us because we're just exploring in our analyses the tremendous choices that we have made and must make in order to be fully ourselves. So basically, what we're going to talk about tonight is whatever comes into our head on any of those levels. And it's Jean, it's your turn. <laughs> Well, I was thinking that I actually didn't agree with you in the car about the more things change, the more they stay the same. I think that um, maybe, maybe when we get to where we can look back on the spirals in our lives, they actually will look very much the same. But at this point, anyway, <laughs> I'm very taken with how different things have been in my, my adult lifetime. And... Um, how opportunities and changes have been major. And also that everybody in this room has been through many different changes, transitions. Uh, everybody has been a... a the, the, the movie star Madonna is sort of known for reinventing herself. Well, we've all had experiences reinventing ourselves, improvising, and we're still here. So... There's like the next round. Now, I was interested when I was talking to Jackie um, of knowing a few facts, uh, one that uh, particularly interested me because um, my mother, who um, 
went to the college that she was president of. Uh, many, I mean, not at the same time, of course. <laughs> And so, though I'm a Western person and, a, and and really don't think of the East as being my place at all, it, I had heard of Bar- Barnard College, and so I started asking Jackie about her career, and I find that it's a very speckled career. Oh, <laughs> and, and one of the things that we touched on uh, just before the cab let me off, and I said to her, you know, I, I threatened to bring up something that I think I will bring up anyway. Right. Well, hearing about her jobs, which I think she ought to tell you, just the titles in a minute, it would appear that she had a ladder that she just went up. But to hear that she got fired along the way was very, very interesting. So what did you do to get yourself fired, and how did you reinvent yourself and get to the next stage? And is there a lesson here in three paragraphs or less? <laughs> I warned her. I'm a storyteller. And even my very best friends get tired of my going on and on. So I'll try to be brief, but it's been a long life. Um, I started out at Yale where I was the only woman in my program and was not allowed to grade papers although I was assumed to be a teaching assistant, except if I sat in the hall and listened to the lectures so I wouldn't distract the young men. Uh, Those degrees, which were master's and doctors in art history and music history, led me... Oh, a long time ago. (laughs) Let's put it this way. I finished my Ph.D. in 54. I'd been pre-med and done a conservatory diploma along the way. I did that, and then in the course of my graduate studies, got married and had two children in rapid succession and finished a dissertation and then discovered, guess what? In the 50s, you could not be married, have children, and be a candidate for a teaching position in a university. So that was the first set of switches. Um, Through a lot of funny circumstances, I ended up as a minor dean at Radcliffe College and a lecturer at Harvard. And one night after a party in which I'd had a lot of wine, I struck up a wonderful discussion with a very short elderly man who seemed to be very intrigued with wanting to know my views on women in higher education and who later uh, called me the next day, my secretary, and I was a very junior dean, 32, came in to say, that President Stratton of MIT was um, wanting to talk to me, and she looked bug-eyed. You know, I was a nothing. So that led to my being a dean at MIT. Up to now, I haven't been fired at all. After doing three years there, of being the first woman administrator at MIT, blah, blah, um, through a set of family difficulties, it became important for me to change locations and jobs. I was lucky in that my great friend and sponsor, President Stratton, put me in for the uh, dean of Sarah Lawrence College in Yonkers, New York, where I went, and then began the trouble. It was in the 60s, and I had grown up in a weird family that believed in racial, ethnic, and gender equality in a time when nobody had ever heard any of those words. So, of course, I felt like I'd come into my own, and I was a young thing of 39 and ready to go. So Sarah Lawrence wasn't so ready to go. Um, We integrated the faculty. We integrated the student body. To be ahead of Sarah Lawrence is something. (laughs) Well, in those days, Sarah Lawrence was totally white, very rich students, Eccentric, creative, and I loved them, everyone. And did you have Joseph Campbell in the woods? In the woods, did you well, say? Well, he had a cabin in the woods where he was studying mythology, and he'd come out and teach the women once in a while on Not quite. mythology. No? He That's had a, an office in which he had many women. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, all of them students, but some faculty. <laughs> Uh, Go on. (laughs) (laughs) At any event, 
then came the time when my president, who was a remarkable woman, uh, Esther Rauschenbusch, stepped down. And I thought she was very old. She was, at that time, 72. I won't tell you. I should tell you. I'm 77, so it doesn't seem so old now. But then it did. And immediately, way, way to go. Way to go. So immediately after that, uh, the board brought in the head of IBM to be chairman of the board because we had let two inadmissible daughters into our student body. And they had survived and done perfectly adequate work. However, when they, this chairman of the board, IBM Watson, um, brought in a vice president, former vice president, whom he was firing by transferring. And he transferred over as president of Barnard. I mean, sorry, Sarah Lawrence handed his money back and immediately decided that I was too radical and had to go. Through a series of funny, funny coincidences, I got to be the first woman administrator of Brown University, which had just merged Pembroke. Not shabby. Not shabby. <laughs> well, Yeah. But I was amazed. At Brown, I felt like a token something or other. My appointment letter said I was responsible, that I was to be the quote, and this is a real quote, conscious of the university for women and minorities. Trouble was, I took it seriously. (laughs) So I spent a heavenly five or six years there in which I got the entire faculty to be one-third minority, the entire third, um, and it was possible to do that because if you control both the hiring function and the salaries, you don't know what you can accomplish. (laughs) All the while being quiet. That was my trademark. I didn't do a lot of talking out. I just changed numbers. So, unfortunately, the the president came a cropper. He was was philandering a bit. And um, that was noted. And so I was told that I would have to leave because as the only woman in the higher at that time in in the Ivy League, if I stayed, they wouldn't be able to consider a woman for president. But since I was the vice president under a now discredited president, I couldn't stay as provost either. So that was the end of that. Then I moved to Barnard. And Barnard was a wonderful school, except that it was under fire from Columbia University that wanted to gobble it up. And right after I took the job, I was told by the then president that if I came into office, he'd see to it that I did not last a year and never again gained a position anywhere in the country. It took him five years and uh, a lot of hard work on both our parts, before I was asked to step down, and it was because I was said to be too radical, which meant that I had attempted to keep Barnard independent of Columbia and had been willing to support uh, ethnic studies, lesbian studies, and some other unmentionals that really nice schools didn't do at that time. And that really was the the major changeover. From then on, the... uh, last 10 years of my life were spent being a troubleshooter for presidents who were in trouble, and I went and got fired again and again. So troubleshooter, troublemaker, they were sort of two sides of the same coin, very Jungian, very Jungian. Jungian. It took me a while to realize it. Now what about you? I don't believe you've been sitting over there being a good girl. You know, Jungians are supposed to be um, very introverted, very withdrawn from the world, caricature type. I'm I'm a little more activist and extroverted than that, and, and so I um, I remember b- being uh, brought into the American Psychiatric Association by a very activist liberal president who had heard. That I was recommended by the chair of my department, who was very, you know, uh, establishment. But I was also recommended by the most radical of the liberal women's groups. So I came aboard as a twofer, you know, woman and Asian. And uh, <laughs> and and uh, it was a time when 
something like 89% of the profession were men, and about 70% of the patients were women. And after I'd been there for a couple of years, there was this whole business of the Equal Rights Amendment in this state that was a particular problem. And um, we gave lip service as an organization to ERA, but when it came to where we would hold our meetings, it was like three unratified states in a row. Well, I believe that there's a certain time when something comes up and you're on the spot. And silence is consent. If you know that if you put yourself on the line that you might make a difference and you can step forward or not as your assignment, and I like that word assignment because I've, I see it in so many different times. I'm just giving one example as an assignment. Uh, way back in my youth, I was a student body this and that and could run for office and do that sort of thing. And then I got to be a much more quiet person and you know did this Jungian business and all that. Well, here we were coming to San Francisco as the American Psychiatric Association, uh, and the discussion around the ERA had gotten the, the old boys so upset that they had a referendum to rescind even the lip service that the APA was supportive of the Equal Rights Amendment. And that was really not only offensive, but given how if you discriminate against somebody, and I did know this from being a twofer, that if you discriminate and are put down, it's not good for your mental health. So how could, how could an organization that, that treated two-thirds of its patients women not see that there was a relationship between inequality and mental health? Well, uh, the next convention that would make the difference was in my home city, San Francisco, and I was the only national-level activist uh, with the Women's Committee. And so that was a moment where I thought, well, if someone's going to become a rabble-rouser, whatever, activist, it would, be, it would be me or no one. I also knew I could do it, you know, because you, you don't... Nothing goes to waste. You know that if you're uh, a therapist. Anything you've ever done sort of comes up with somebody or other. But it's true as we improvise and reinvent ourselves also, that nothing goes to waste. That if I knew how to make posters and write speeches at one other point in my life, I could do it here too. And that's how I got to know Gloria Steinem, invited her to come out to address the American Psychiatric Association off official grounds. That's where I learned how to pick it. Invited, uh, got lessons in how to pick it, how to chant, how to use a, how to use a bullhorn. <laughs> picketed the organization and did a PR job on them and with great big pins and newspapers and whatever, and it was in San Francisco. So the American Psychiatric Association's Board of Trustees voted to um, not go to the, the next convention, which was going to be in New Orleans, and voted $25,000 to try to get the ER ratified in Illinois. So then, that was in May. In June, they went back to their to Washington, to home base, and it was like waking up wondering, who did I sleep with in San Francisco? <laughs> the, the guys heard from the other guys about what, what do you think you're doing. So they ended up rescinding that, but still voting 20, the $25,000 didn't change things, obviously, here, but... They kept it in the pond. And meanwhile, I got moved more into that activist side. Got to know Gloria Steinem. Got, uh, went from, I actually had risen in the ranks in the APA, so I had been chair of the Council on National Affairs, but now I moved over and what became a member of the Ms. Foundation for Women Board. So it's been a speckled career too, you know, an interesting one where, where, where what you're drawn to, but also what shows up and says, okay, will you take this on as an assignment? Will you say yes? Uh, and I just find that this picking up the idea of you could do something or nothing and it's your choice uh, has propelled me through some very interesting phases of life. Well, I'd like to pick up on that last phrase, doing something or nothing. Because I think that's really where our institute is. 
We are at a point where we have expended the invested funds, and we are selling our, biz- our building and trying to decide as a board uh, what will happen to the money that are the proceeds. We could do nothing. It is to say we can invest that money and wait for the world to change and catch up with depth psychology again and for the market to rebound. And there would be money in the bank and perhaps no institute or perhaps an office with a director and a secretary and financial officer. Or we can hope that we could use at least a portion of that, a significant portion, to take off and find out how we could reinvent ourselves the way you're talking about individually. Well, you know where I'd be on, on this. Because it, Go for it. It's, it's not just a matter of, uh, first of all, it's always a matter of how much goodwill, depth investment, how much soul a, a, a organization has. Um, I remember when I was in a crisis setting with my particular institute, it was when I had to decide whether I was going to continue jumping through one more hoop to become an analyst. And since I have a certain certain rebellious quality in me, I was wondering about doing that. And <clears throat> I was talking to an Episcopalian priest um, who didn't realize that what he was saying about the church was also what I needed to think about for myself. You know how that is when you, you see people as patients or clients, that that often what they bring in terms of a dream or a thought is food for yourself. Um, I was initially attracted to Jungian psychology when I was a first-year in first-year resident in psychiatry, and I was realizing that I really cared what was happening to my people and that I was learning something, and that it was a mutual relationship, even though that wasn't the model. And then I read Menninger on the different kinds of therapies, and he said that Jung saw psychotherapy like a chemical reaction for one of the elements, the patient to be changed, the other element the doctor also had to be in the process. And I saw those chemical reactions going forward and where the two compounds mix and they are different on the other side of the equation. And since I was being affected by the people I saw, before I read Jung, before I even met a Jungian analyst, the idea got to me uh, from manager quoting Jung. So being uh, in the place where where um, this priest was ta- telling me about he was having difficulty with his diocese and politics and whatever, but he he talked about how every organization, institution that has endured, endures because there's something about its essence that really matters. That, That he called that faith. And then there is the institution, the people, whose egos, whose hierarchies, whose need for fundraising and everything gets... Uh, you know, gets all this prominent attention. And basically he was talking about there's faith and then there is institution. And that there's a, again, this is very Jungian, there's a, there's a tension in some ways of opposites between the two. But the faith could not, the essence of whatever it is, couldn't be brought forward without the flawed human, ego-ridden, et cetera, et cetera, committee-ridden, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> All of the all of the problems that have to do with organization, and we all know it because they are really the same problems we have with family. You know that that there are personality difficulties, there there are uh, defenses, there are different psychological types that that make for uh, not a smooth organization sometimes. But often, when people are in touch with the reason for the organization, when they drop deeper into the self, which Jung contributed to psychology, the whole notion that at the basis of each of us individually and of the meaning of our lives, that we are in touch with something that he used the word largest self, whether it's meaning, it's the archetype of meaning, but that could be also the word for God or goddess or Tao or purpose in life. That if you are in touch with the purpose of your life, you do find that it's about soul and spirit. It isn't about making money and 
and raising a huge number of memberships or whatever. But if you pay attention to that and you're an organization, then if you have a competent organization that knows how to do things like raise money and know how to do things like paying the rent and all that stuff, then you have a really going concern because it has soul. And I am... This is a... I'm pleased to be the last speaker in this building. This is the institution, institute that more than any other institute in the country, including my own, that I have taught more depth weekends with than any other. And it, it has been a privilege to come here and to watch this building go and be for, uh, go up when it, was, when it was a dream. And I can remember um, knowing that, that Chicago became a model for community and analysts working together. Every other uh, city has its associations of friends of Jung, they're usually called. I was curious about, you know, do you call up people and say, do you want to be a friend of Jung? <laughs> but there are lay organizations that are friends of Jung, um, and then there is a professional organization, which is a society of Jungian analysts, and that's the usual way it is everywhere. This particular city had a Jungian institute that had analysts and ordinary people, citizens, as equal participants in making this institute work. And it was a model like nobody else's. And our institute in San Francisco has, has looked, uh, looked towards you at one point to wonder how you did it. Um, and you did it. And like every other institution that is actually based on life force of some sort, it goes through changes. So now you have, you know, you've, you've, you've had your, your uh, really, whatever you call those days where things really are, you know, when, halcyon. halcyon days or whatever, you know, where, where you had these great conferences and drew people. In fact, you put on the best national conferences in town, in, you know, in, in the country and things. And now um, things have changed, but so has, it, has th things changed for the country. And, and never before have people had to ask themselves, what does it mean to be an American? And what, are, are, what are the deep values that, that truly matter? What is the soul of this country? Um, what do I hold on to personally of soul when I am afraid and people are afraid, afraid of because so many people have lost work. Um, for the first time when I fly, I think, well, you know, one of those little bazooka-type uh, weapons that shoot a stinger, that, that uh, a missile that, that once shot at, it's heat-seeking. It, it, it aims for, air, it can aim for an airplane. And in a matter of seconds, it can go 15,000 feet. And if the airplane is coming in, it could blow it up. Um, there are things to be concerned about that are in mind, much more that when, when everybody was going to workshops and everything was expansive and we all seemed to be just growing and growing deeper, growing richer, growing smarter, growing older. We did that about a decade ago. Everything was expansive. And that was when this institute was really booming. But now is when the message of meaning is more important than ever. So I, and here you have this woman who's ahead of her time leading the way. It isn't I who lead the way. It's a group of dedicated women and some men who are working unbelievably to preserve both the self the soul of the place, and who are willing to give of themselves in a way that only some place that has the kind of meaning for them that this one does could possibly continue. They have done it not once, but you're in and you're out. I think, too, that this is not a time for growth for any nonprofit and not any church or synagogue. Everybody is struggling. But those of us who are absolutely committed to the continuation of the Institute share a vision of what it is to be part of humanity and what it is to be seeking a kind of growth that will enable us to serve the world. It's not just about 
ourselves. It's about who we become in order that we may be a more positive force individually and collectively in the world. And it's never been more needed. And if those of us who hang in there and are true to this place, wherever we may find ourselves renting space next year, I don't believe there's any way we can do anything but succeed in carrying on the mission. And that's really what it's about. I bet in this room, everybody is here in part because they have been changed in some way by something that was offered here because it was here. Um, I know that, that those of us whose lives have been really majorly changed by the women's movement, when we become of crone age, there is a wanting to give back, appreciating that we are where we are because other women were bra burners and marchers and, and uh, did the kinds of things that made it possible uh, for us to have uh, more opportunities. And then the next generation, when we really succeed, take it for granted. That's that, I found that was very interesting. That I used to mind it when the medical, when, when my daughter's generation would talk about anything that they could do. You know, they could be lawyers, they could be doctors, they could do this, that, and the other thing. They could travel to Europe by themselves, etc. And and then not my daughter because she's been raised properly, so she doesn't say, "And I am not a feminist." I don't. <laughs> But so many of that generation will will say that, and then they will say, and I am not a feminist, used to rankle me. Well, I used to think to myself, who do you think opened those doors? So that there are 50% of most medical classes are often women, and law classes and now th- theology places and corporate businesses, you know, up the ladder, et cetera. And then I saw that um, that documentary on the suffragettes and how... From 1848 to 1920, they pushed so that women could vote. 1920 was not very long ago. And I don't think of myself as a suffragette. I just take voting for granted. Of course I can vote, naturally. So that the women's movement has made such a difference that our daughters don't think, and I'm a feminist, and I can really appreciate that they can just assume they can do what they want to do, which I think is wonderful. But there, those of us who have some awareness of history uh, do have a sense that institutions that keep the message going matter, whether it is uh, an openness to, to women and women's wisdom, whether it is an openness to Jungian ideas. You know, both are threatening to fundamental-type minds. Uh, to do what we say to be who you are supposed to be as we see you is really the message that we all got, men and women, from the women's movement. We got the notion of stereotypes. We got the notion that that we had expectations placed on us, and that was who we were supposed to be. Well, Jung was very subversive in talking about individuation. Uh, it's very subversive to say you should follow a path with heart. You should listen to your dreams. You should be different because you, by being different, you're being truer to yourself. Well, I do really think that having a Jungian institute that offers things to the public doesn't just elitely keep its, its message to those who can afford to do uh, weekly or biweekly analysis, but really makes it available because a seeker will find it. There's something of a... There's synchronicity happens. You find it, but it also has to be out there. And you have to know it's there. When well, it, sometimes it just... Sometimes know, it, it works, but sometimes you have to find but it, it. But it has to be there. Right. If it's not there, it's hard to find. <laughs> uh, we right. hope that people are going to find this institute for a long time. Well, even if you don't have an address? Oh, we'll have an address. Well, where are you going? Don't know yet. The well, building is sold, right? Pardon me? This building has been sold. Uh-huh. It's going to be torn down. Yes, it is. These, not everybody seems to know that. Well, it's because we haven't, uh, haven't had the closing. But the important thing, I think, is that we have to remember that wherever the place, it's not the place that is the Institute. The Institute is us. Everybody in this room and everybody who will be here for your lecture 
and many hundreds of people who won't be here, but sometimes are here. And it seems to me that one of our things that we as a board have hoped for is that in this change into smaller quarters, it will be kind of concentrated. In gerontology, which is my second field, my late life field, we say the more, the more, which means the older you get, the more distilled the characteristics of your personality. The older this institute gets, I hope, the more distilled, the more potent its very essence will be. And I think if we do that, we will find the energy then to take the messages of Jung to many more kinds of people than we have been able to up to now. And that will be a very important step. I'll say amen, sister, to that. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org. Thank you to our 2019 supporter-level donors, Bill Alexi, Usha and Ashok Beatty, Circle Center Yoga, Arlo and Rena Kampan, Eric Cooper and Judith Cooper, Lorna Crowell, D. Scott Dayton, George J. Didier, The Cole Family Foundation, Ramakrishnan and Full Bloom Lotus, Suzanne G. Rosenthal, Deborah Stutzman, Deborah Tobin, Alexander Wayne and Lynn Kopp, and Gerald Weiner. If you would like to support this podcast, just go to youngchicago.org slash give.